All right, good afternoon, everybody. So I get the witching hour of Thursday at 3 o'clock, post-lunch, first day, time zone changes, all of it in one package. And I'm grateful you all signed up for this uh, presentation that we're doing today of People, Podcasts, and Publishing, which is a play on uh, the book I wrote recently, Christ, Culture, and Cinema. And you're, you're going to hear a little bit about the book today, uh, but more about the genesis of how this idea came to be and how really anybody in ministry can do what I do. That there is really nothing unusual here but just taking an idea and running down the field with it. Uh, so with that being said, Let's start with the first P. And, and to me, everything flows in ministry from this first P, which is people. Uh, and you stop and you think about people. Uh, you look around this unbelievable event. Uh, years and years ago, when it first started, I was in Tucson, Arizona. And I drove up from Tucson, and there's, I don't know, a couple of hundred people here, maybe. Great time, a lot of fun. We sort of all knew each other. Fast forward, there's over 2,300 people here. This campus was not designed for 2,300 people. And yet, everybody here is running into people that you know. There's reunion, there's relationships, there's rekindled friendships, there's all that going on. So as we start thinking about people, I want you to think about who are your specific people. Who are they, what are they, and where are they? Who are your people? Who are the ones that you are interacting with on a regular and fairly consistent basis? Where are they? Where do you find these folks? You know, is it the local gym? Is it the coffee bar? Is it the bar? Is it the golf course? Where are these people? And in turn, what are they? What is your relationship to them? Start thinking more intentionally about where God has dropped you. Because every community is unique and it's different. Every community has its own vibe and own thing going on. So I'm now in Jacksonville, Florida, but I am the well-traveled parish pastor. My route started in St. Matthew's in Hastings-on-Hudson, New York. It is as beautiful as its name. Uh, I lived in a house that was once upon a time owned by the Farragut family. You know, Admiral Farragut, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, that Farragut. The house overlooked the Hudson River. It was spectacular. Uh, the church was 140 years old when I got there. It predated the Missouri Synod. Okay? But I've also lived in New Jersey. Where I grew up, I served a church there. Long Island, New York, which, by the way, believes it is the 51st state of the United States. It really does. It has its own unique vibe and culture than the city or the rest of the state of New York. I lived in Tucson, Arizona. Now I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Do any of you know where Jacksonville, Florida is? Well, you've been there, so you can't answer. Uh, if you were to look at the state of Florida, we are in the very northeast corner of the state. If you drive about 10 miles from the Jacksonville line, you're in Georgia. And the further north you go in Florida, the more southern it gets. Yeah. So we are really the deep south. It's a very different culture than, say, Miami. We get winter. Well, not Minnesota winter. I have to apologize for our Minnesotan in the back. It's not Minnesotan winter, but for Floridians, it got cold enough a couple of weeks ago that the iguanas were falling out of the trees. And that really does happen. It is hilarious. They just kind of flop out. You think they're dead. Don't touch them. They're not dead. So where do you intersect with people outside of the church? Where are the places that you, as a pastor or church worker or church member, interact with people outside of the confines of your church? church campus. When you leave that piece of dirt, that geographical spot, where are they? Where are you going and where are you running into them? Because you are. Now, there's two ways in which we do this. We do it intentionally and unintentionally. Let's think about that for a moment. There are times that you are intentionally seeking out to be in the presence of other people 
and there are other times that it is incredibly unintentional. So what does that mean? Intentional is purposefully seeking to interact. So what are some activities where you would purposefully seek out other people to interact? This is participatory. It may not be like other things. There are giveaways too. The more you participate, the more things you get. Hospital calls. So when you go to the hospital, it's a very intentional visit, but do you only see the person you're going to visit? No. You're going to go maybe be the person in the room with them, the person at the desk who gives you the room number. Some hospitals have parking attendants. There's maybe the nurse at the counter when you see that the door is closed. and you, There's a lot of intentionality in, in that hospital call. Where else? Intentionally. Social media. Social media. Explain. Nice. Social media is a place where we are interacting with people, although there are those who do not believe that that is community. It really is community. We are creating these social media communities where people are interacting in a very, very personal way. That's such a good answer. You get Christ culture and candy. Look at this. Oh Holy cow! CPH made candy for me. Isn't that aw that's, that's awesome. That's really good stuff. Where else? The social media, hospitals, where else? Community events. Community events, such as? We have auto shows, we have uh, all kinds of events, uh, arts and crafts. So you have chosen to go to that community event. You've yeah. chosen to go there, be in the midst of other people who have that shared interest with you. For me, two places where I intentionally seek out community in my life. One is obvious, movies. I don't like watching movies on my television. I am too distracted. I, I can't sit still. I may have ADHD. I, I just don't do well with the look Klinkenberg in the back's like, well, duh, of course. Uh, I can't watch a movie at home. I have the dog. I have the refrigerator. I have my phone. I have all these things around me. And my favorite moment in a movie is when they say, it's now time for the feature presentation. Silence your cell phones. Because now I'm in a community of other people who have chosen to see this particular movie. I want to be there. The second place where I seek out community is every Monday I play golf. That's my rhythm. I go to a golf course and I always hope I get hooked up with other people. And, and that's hopefully the genesis of another idea. Uh, I'm working on another idea for something that maybe or maybe not CPH will want to do. but. When I go play golf, I go alone. I do not have a regular partner. So I get to the golf course, they usually hook me up with other people. Everybody has a story. Not everybody has somebody to listen to it. I become the guy who listens to the stories. So it's an intentional choosing to be with those people. How about the unintentional? This is interaction that happens whether we want it to or not. Let's think about where is interaction with people unintentional. Thank you. There it is. The grocery store. My wife does not like taking me to the grocery store anymore. Because all I do is complain about the prices that are going up and the shelves that are empty. And she's always going, shh, other people will hear you. It's very unintentional, that place. Where else? Gym. The gym. So I go to the gym in the morning. Six o'clock in the morning guy, go to the gym. I hate the gym. I hate working out. I am not one of those people who says, yes, I feel so good after I work out. I don't. I feel miserable. I want to go home. I want to shower. And then I want to get on with my day. But I want to live a long, healthy life. There are people around me. Now, I can choose to interact with them. Or I can choose to tunnel vision. So at the gym, I'm a tunnel vision guy. But you know there's always the mayor of the gym, right? The mayor, of the, that's the person who never lifts a weight but talks to everybody. You, I do my whole workout and they're, they're doing this. They're like, hey, how you doing? And they're over here talking to this person. And they've not lifted a single weight. But that's their, for them, that's an intentional community. For me, entirely unintentional. Give me another unintentional community. All the way in the back. Yeah. So it's intentional in that I've chosen to be in that space but it's unintentional with regards to who is around me. 
Now, how, did the, how does that change? I have a retired pastor in my congregation. He is a long-suffering season ticket holder to the Jacksonville Jaguars. There is a special seat in heaven for him. Okay, wow. And he doesn't just have a seat. He has a seat in the last row in the upper deck of the stadium. There's nobody in the stadium, but he sits in his section because he has developed an intentional community around him. But it's become uncomfortable because they now know he's the pastor. And they come with him with all of their problems during the game. But that may not be so bad because the game is usually terrible. And he's talking about changing his seat because he wants a little less intention and more unintentional in that community. Okay? Yeah. Now, having said all this, this is where the culture collides. And, and if there's anything you're going to get from me today is think about culture. Think long and hard about culture. And it's different regarding where you happen to be. Your culture is different than my culture. And that's, that's great. You know you have a church culture, but we also have community culture. We also have uh, neighborhood cultures. We have town or city cultures. I mean, I have a northeast, southern culture. Fill in all the blanks. When we interact with people, then we experience culture, the characteristics and expanding knowledge of a people. Culture changes us. It forces us to see things, experience things, live things differently than we might. We can't build walls high enough to somehow protect what we are. There's too much static and noise that flows into our world that's going to challenge what we know as right or true. That's culture. Now, culture encompasses, and I want you to think about all the things that culture encompasses. It encompasses things like language, words and phrases, food, social habits and norms, music, art, sports, entertainment, and just about anything and everything you think of. So, give me some ideas of what is unique in your respective culture, because what are some of the states you're all from? I see like John Davis is Texas. We have some Californians here. We got Minnesota in the back. What are some other places we have in the room? Wisconsin. There you go. Sorry for the Packers this year. You know. Oh, now I'm really sorry. Okay. Uh, what other places do we have? Illinois. Illinois, Mon Montana. Hawaii. God, Hawaii, how, why are you here? <laughs> Hawaii, that's awesome. Where else? Virginia. Virginia. Let's talk about cultures. What's unique in your respective place? Give me something unique in your that you think is unique to your culture. What is that? Hot, what is what in the world is just because just because I have no idea what you're talking about, you know, Tom Evans gets candy. All right. Hot dish. What is hot dish? Oh, it's a casserole. Okay, casserole. You have any idea what hot dishes? Oh, okay. So you cheated. I have no idea. I'm a guy from New Jersey. We didn't. We called it a casserole. Huh? What's that? Friday, West Texas. There you go. Well, so my brother, my brother is a retired petroleum engineer, and he lived in all the hot spots of Texas. So places like Midland, Odessa, Big Spring, and then he had to cross the border for Hobbs, New Mexico for a stint, and he was there by Permian Basin High School in lovely Odessa, Texas, high school football. Yeah, that's, that's, not, that's not the case in a lot of places, is it? Good. What else? You need cultural piece. All the way in the back. Mm -hmm. And so that is basically an extension of your nuclear family. Okay. And I really love that just because of the sense of we're all connected and we <clears throat> look out and take care of each other. And, and then Neat. the Aloha spirit, which means kindness, greeting, goodbye. So those are beautiful cultural pieces that you're now a part of. So this is what I want you to kind of consider as you think about people, relationships, and culture, and how that is all pressing, and it gets messy. There's nothing neat and tidy about this, is there? 
And this is, I think, one of the hardest things for the church. Because we, we try to create this bastion of church culture. But the church is where? In the world. Which means we're in the culture. So as you're, as you're kind of considering your people, think about these. Now, having said that, there is a collision. And cultures collide. Uh, as a child of God, you live as an alien in the midst of the cultural storm. You know, Jesus says this, right? He says, you're different. You're set apart. You're my child. You're to live differently. But he doesn't say live differently on a compound out in the middle of nowhere where I will build a huge wall and everything's going to be great. No, he dumps us into the storm of the culture. It's John 17, 14 to 16. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not a part of the world. He never said you're not going to live in the world, though. <laughs> he never said you're not going to interact with the culture. He never said you're not going to be challenged by different ideas, different opinions, different art, different music, different everything. He said you are. But always remember your anchor point that you are a redeemed, called, chosen child of God. Jesus' desire is that you and I remain in the midst of the culture that is in the midst of people. So... Regardless of where you serve, or where you live, or where you participate in ministry, uh-oh, there's people. And that's okay. That's good. That's what Jesus has given us to do, to be in the midst of these people. Now, with that, there is a warning. However, when interacting with the culture, you and I need to do a faith check. How is your walk with Jesus? Am I strong enough not to lose the sure footing of my faith? And do I have a voice to speak into the cultural maelstrom? So, have you ever had that moment where, where your pastor or a pastor has said to you, you know, brings up the E word? You know what the E word is, right? There it is, evangelism. Nobody wants to be on that evangelism committee. I'm telling you. Nobody does because it's scary. It means I've got to go talk about my faith to somebody else. And we always think back to the old methodologies. In, in the Stone Age, when I was at the seminary, uh, we had uh, uh, good old Biesenthal came with the red binder. And he followed the script and you know, he did the cold calls and knocked on the doors. You know, My, my evangelism weekend in seminary was in North St. Louis. North St. Louis. Yeah. We, we, we didn't culturally look like we fit into North St. Louis, even in 1989, 90, thereabouts. And it was scary. It was not comfortable. Now, we don't use the E word. How about just where can you have a spiritual conversation? Where can you talk about Jesus? Where can you talk about spiritual things? Sometimes you, ha you can have a great spiritual conversation and Jesus never comes up. Because you're talking with somebody about their brokenness, their challenges. I, I go back to my golf cart stories. A true story happened about four weeks ago. Uh, like I said, I play golf every Monday. I play a lot of golf. And uh, when I was out on the golf course, I get paired up with two guys. Between the two of them, and this is just introduction. I just introduced myself. They see the Reverend Dr. Bag Tag from the USGA on my golf bag. So right away, you know, preacher. I've become preacher. So I figure right away they must be Baptist. You know, I'm in, I'm in the South. This might fit. Before long, I knew that between these two men, they had five marriages, 11 kids. 
A man's father-in-law committed suicide. One of his marriages was to a Mormon. He knew he wasn't Mormon, couldn't stay with her, ended up divorced. Lived here in Arizona, went to El Charo, excellent Mexican food in Tucson, by the way. If you ever get down there, eat at El Charo or Guadalajara Grill. Giving you two good ones for you. And this was just because I introduced myself. Now, did I have an opportunity to bring a spiritual conversation to a day? Yes. That, by the way, is the hook for what I'm trying to get Concordia Publishing House to bite on. I don't think they will, but we're going to try. So, yeah, where can I speak into the cultural maelstrom? Where do I have a voice to speak into that? 2 Peter chapter 3, 17 and 18. You therefore, beloved, know this beforehand. Take care that you are not carried away with the error of the lawless people and lose your own stability. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the end of eternity. Amen. Be careful. <laughs> So don't get sucked into it, but be a part that speaks to it. Don't find yourself getting dragged into the chaos. Speak to the chaos. It's another golf one, because this is my intersection with people. I'm not very good. Now, others will think I'm a very good golfer. To some I am, to others you're not. There's always somebody way better than you, and there's always somebody way worse. That's kind of my measuring stick. And I play every year, I go, down, I go up to Myrtle Beach, and I play in this thing called the World Amateur Golf, where about 4,500 golfers come together to figure out who is the best of the best. I always go there to figure out how bad I really am. That's kind of my measuring stick. All right? And I've had guys on countless occasions when my round is just coming apart at the seams, because it's competitive golf, playing by the rules, you're playing with strangers, you never know who you're going to play with. And if I hit a bad shot, I honestly, I start to laugh. I start to laugh. Why do I start to laugh? My paycheck is not dependent on how that golf ball goes. I am here to have fun. Now, I've had other guys lose their brains, throw their clubs, slam things around, drink too much. I have to guard myself. It's real easy to get drawn into this. Now, what happens when I start to laugh? Two things. Either A, they think there's something wrong with me, or B, they go, we really love your spirit about this. You're like different out here. What's up with you? And that opens up the door. And the next thing you know, we're having a spiritual conversation that otherwise we would have never had because I've guarded my spirit against the challenge that is before me. All right, so... Where do you intersect with the culture today? For you sitting here, I've come up with some ideas, but this is to me your application moment. Where do you intersect with culture in an intentional way where you get to speak into that culture with other people? For me, it was real easy. It's movies, and we're going to talk more about the movies. But I love movies. I love bad movies. I love hideous movies. Uh, you name it, I'll watch it. My wife thinks there is seriously something wrong with me with some of the movies I'll watch. She goes, this is awful. And it's like, no, it's good. We keep watching it, honey. It's all right. We're going to, no, no, no. And she'll get up and like walk out of the room when we're at home. And she's like, we've seen this 75 times. I love movies. So for me, it's an easy intersection and conversation piece. Uh, for some, it's camping. And there is a whole culture of campers out there. I had a woman in my church, um, she died, and she and her husband were diehard campers. They belonged to a camper club. They had little matching red vests. And, and all these people came to the funeral. And I would tell you, most of them were not Christian. But what an influence she had in that cultural piece. Uh, hiking. You're out here in the, uh, Arizona. Are any of you hiking while you're here? Yeah. Do you know why you hike in Arizona? Because there's not much else to do, honestly. I mean, it's like we got rocks, we got mountains, let's go hike. Uh, my, wife got it, my wife and I, when we lived here, got into the hiking culture, which actually led to us, we were on the cusp of buying a firearm 
not not for the you know we got to protect ourselves from the world. It was protecting ourselves. We got stalked by a mountain lion on one of our hikes. So that was part of the unique conversations we had with other hikers of what you experience when you're out in the wilderness. I know some of you are into books, and just think of movies. Books are flat versions of movies, and you can do what I do with books. If you're a book person. That is a great place. Sports. I, I heard Stadium mentioned before, but just think of the tapestry of sports, whether it be professional or college or participatory, all the sports that you can intersect with people. For many of you, it's tennis. You know, they're tennis clubs. The uh, family my wife worked for, she's a professional nanny in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, Jacksonville Beach. And the people she worked for, their community was tennis. You know, she would, they were two emergency room doctors, and on their day off, they belonged to a tennis club. And they would go and play tennis. That was their crossing point. Uh, music. Any of you like music? Yeah, go, go to Jim Marriott's thing when Jim is talking, or get to know Jim Marriott from the seminary. Brilliant guy on music. But that's a cross point. And, and think of all the genres of music. Just think of all these layers you can jump into. For some, it's dance. That is not me. This is not a dancer's body, and that's okay. But for others, it really is. Uh, fishing. I live in Jacksonville. I'm in a fishing culture. I got a lot of, well, I, you know, they're my good old boys in the church that like to go fishing and come back with all sorts of things. I mean, there's a huge fishing contest, uh, the Kingfish uh, Fishing Contest in Jacksonville every year. Thousands of people going out and fishing. That is a community. And then, of course, I mentioned before golf. That's me. What is yours? Where do you find intentional community in the culture where you interact with people, where you have something, where you get to speak spiritual things into that space. All right? You have that kind of in your mind? Kind of thinking that through? Beautiful. We experience these things with other people, but we also experience these things through our unique lenses of our Christian faith. Have that picture. What is that thing or things? How are you seeing it through the lenses of our culture, through the lenses of your faith? So, without my glasses, I'm functionally not good. <laughs> I wear bifocals. They would love to give me trifocals. I am resisting that temptation. Uh, but lenses matter. And, and we see everything through whatever lenses we're putting in front of ourselves. So, you're seeing the culture through whatever the lenses are that make you you. You are not me, I am not you, and that's great. Because you have different experiences that got you to here. We do have the shared lens of our Christian faith. We're seeing everything through that shared lens as well. So now that you have that and think about that thing or things where you interact, here's your critical alert. Are you really passionate about whatever it is in your mind's eye? I mean, is this one of those things that's like non-negotiable for you? Like, my life doesn't work if I don't have this in it. Now, those who know me, movies and golf are my passion points. They just are. My wife is a saint. I wish she was here. She would laugh, but she really is a saint. She, she never questions me playing golf. Is, is that not a blessed woman? That's a, there it is, right here. You get that? Just, just for agreeing with me right there. That's good. Yeah, she never begrudges me that. She knows I need it. She knows I need that time for my head to clear, to be engaged in something I love, and I go do that. We share movies. We're both passionate. We're not passionate about the same ones. So it forces us to experience different genres with each other. No greater love hath than this, than your wife goes to zombie land double tap with you. Okay? Think about that for a moment. I love zombie land. Is it a good movie? <laughs> fabulous movie. Oh my gosh, this is a fabulous movie. Uh, my wife, she's not, she not about any of that. But 
I sat down and I watched with her Spencer. Have you seen Spencer? Spencer is a, a, a made-up story with some historical fact of Lady Diana and the Christmas Eve and day and week with the royals when everything was falling apart. It is as bizarre a movie as I have seen in a long time. But I was willing to expose myself to it because we share the passion. Okay? Do you want to share your perspective about whatever that passion is with other people through the lenses of your faith? Do you want to have faith conversations about whatever that passion is? And, and I want you to think about what that passion is for a moment because you're going, well, how can I do that, say, like with tennis or golf or the opportunities are limitless if you're passionate. That's the key word, passionate. And then finally, are you willing to learn, to listen, and grow? Because the first thing you have to realize is, I don't know everything. So am I willing to learn more about this? And talk to other people about it. Uh, will I grow? Will I allow myself to grow? Because in our church today, there's, there's a lot of lack of growth. <laughs> We're, we we want to kind of keep ourselves in a box. There, there's not a lot of venturing out into the culture with the gospel, with our faith, with spiritual conversations. I've never had anybody on a golf course get mad at me because I was a Christian. Because it's how you carry yourself, and if you're willing to listen, hear their story and grow. I've never had anybody get crazy at me for what I've talked about in a movie. And we'll, we'll, we're going to get to that in the publishing P. But it's fascinating when you're willing to be transparent, but listen to them. Listen to the culture. All right, so we have those three in our mind's eye. We have our thing in our mind's eye. You ready for the second P? Yes. You sure? Yes. All right, get candy for that. That's what that's. You know, so you, so if you say yes, you get things. This is how this works. All right, podcasts. I'm sure that's why a lot of you are here. Are you, a lot of you here because of podcasts. Have you thought about podcasting? Yeah. All right. So I stumbled into this in a very backwards way, and I'm going to give credit where credit was due. It was about two and a half years ago, three years ago. Um, I was here, and I had this idea. And I'm friends with Tim Allman. Tim is at Christ Greenfield Lutheran Church here in the Phoenix area, just due east of here. Tim is a dynamic guy. I, I say Tim is my fire aim load guy. I mean, he's just high energy. All the, he makes me look like I'm drugged. Okay, he's just poof, he's out there. And I knew he was doing a podcast on Christian leadership. And I said, talk to me about how you started. Give me the nuts and bolts. So he put me in touch with a guy in his church to kind of put this together. And we were off and running. So this gives you kind of a time frame that this idea has been from infancy to where it is now is about a three-year window. All right? So you have a passion about the inter what intersects with people. Here are the questions I want you to ask yourself before you ever start a podcast. <laughs> Does my faith have anything to say about this topic? Because there's a lot of things we can be passionate about that has nothing, I mean absolutely nothing, for our faith to speak into it. Because we just don't have enough. You know, we, we may have something to speak into it, but do we have a lot to speak into it? Secondly, does my passion, plus my knowledge of whatever this thing is, plus my faith, equal... Here's the key words, a sustainable platform. Can I sustain what I'm about to venture down the road with? Have you ever done this in ministry? You have this great idea. You have this, this cute little idea. Did you ever see the movie Tommy Boy? We're going to do movies now. And he has the cars. This is my sale. And he's going the car. It's my little sale. And the next thing you know, he's destroying it. Because he, he crushes his little sale. Now, we can do that in ministry real easily, can't we? We have this wonderful, robust idea, but we don't put everything in place to sustain this 
for the long haul. Or even if it's a seasonal thing, to get it to the end of the season. Have you ever had that where you're just running out of energy while you're doing it? You go, "Ah, this is never going to end. I've had sermons like that that I'm preaching where I'm going, where is the off-ramp on this sermon? For the pastors, have you ever had that moment? Yeah, Pentecost, my third year of ministry. I will never forget the sermon. I was boring myself. It was like, stop, stop the words coming out of your mouth. You know, it's this kind of... So, is your idea sustainable? Because podcasting is not for the faint of heart. This needs to be, and we're going to get into this, regular. It needs to be repeatable. It needs to be predictable. We're going to talk about these things. So, enter the podcast. So, what is a podcast? It is a digital audio file made available on the internet for downloading to a computer or a mobile device. It is typically available as a series with new installments on a consistent basis, which can be received automatically by subscription. So says the great Google machine. That's a podcast. That's your definition of a podcast. At the moment, they have me being recorded. Here it is, our little recorder. And so far we're 35 minutes, 46 seconds into the presentation. This is a digital file which could be turned into a podcast for best practices in ministry. All right, so keep that in mind. It's a digital audio file. All right, having said that, what do you need to get started? So where do you begin? This was my call to Tim Allman and the people at Christ Greenfield. So what is it that I need? I'm green, I have no idea, but show me how to do it. So number one, and this is the most important thing, your sustainable idea that you are passionate about. I give you Christ culture and cinema. I love movies. I like to talk about movies. When I preach, sometimes I preach in movies. You can carry on an entire conversation using lines from movies without ever having an original thought of your own. Have you ever tried to do that? I can do that. All right. Now, you have this idea. I'm passionate about movies. Is it sustainable? Well, how many movies are there? If I did a podcast every single day until I die or Jesus returns, there are still going to be more movies than I can do. So, sustainability. Check that box. Am I passionate about what it is I'm going to sustain? Well, I love movies. So what's your favorite movie? Here, Paul, favorite movie. Put you on the spot. What is your favorite movie? Spaceballs, Mel Brooks, John Candy. Big hell, you know, the, the big helmet, dark helmet. Oh, Rick Moranis, brilliant. Yes, what else? Oh, Monty Python, the Holy Grail, not once, not twice, but on thrice, yes. It's just a flesh wound, yes, beautiful. Mary Poppins, oh, it's so beautiful, I love Mary Poppins. Have you seen the sequel? Oh, it's not bad, it's not bad. By the way, if you're on the Disney genre, if you haven't seen Cruella, oh my gosh, is that so good. That is a fabulous movie. See, am I getting excited about this? I can just talk movies with you for the rest of this presentation. Passionate. Are you passionate about it? So sustainability and passion, before you ever listen to anything else, I want you to think about that is the most important thing before you venture down any further. Now, you need a computer in the year 2022. I would suspect if you don't have one, you have access to one. And the reason for that is everything can be done on the computer. You could stop right here, and you don't need anything else I'm about to go through. Because you can do a digital recording on your computer. How many of you, during these lovely days of COVID, were introduced to this interesting tool called Zoom? Hey, we love Zoom. Yay, let's have another Zoom meeting. But if you hit record on Zoom, on the bottom there's a little thing that says record and hit it. When you're done, hit end, hit camp, uh, meeting over, and guess what pops up? A video file, an MP4, and a digital audio file of your Zoom. You can use Zoom to record your digital files for a podcast. That's all you need. Now your quality isn't going to be very good, 
But that's all you need to do this. Okay? Now, a microphone. I would highly, highly recommend get a microphone. You can, you can go crazy on microphones, but get a decent, reasonable microphone with a windshield or cover. So you'll see a picture in a bit of what our studio looks like, and we, we've kind of gone crazy at our church with this. But a microphone, I think, is necessary. They now come with USB plugs. You can plug it, guess what, right into your computer. A microphone stand. You know why? I, I, we do our podcast. It's myself and my associate, and my associate is clumsy. So he always has his gigantic Chicago Cub thing of water, and when he like puts it down on the table, when we didn't have microphone stands, it was making a racket. So we don't want to distract people with silly noise. So a microphone stand. And again, you can go on Amazon. How many of you have an Amazon account? No, I will not give you my password, uh, but we were talking earlier. Uh, but you can get all this on Amazon, and I'm not talking big bucks. So a microphone and a microphone stand for anything that's even remotely okay, 50 bucks, 40 bucks. You're not talking big money. Uh, we use a digital recorder. This is a picture of the exact unit we use. So we bought this little guy, and if you can believe, this little guy has four microphone inputs to it. It is uh, slick as possible. I think it cost me $125 or $30. We have a little one of this, a miniature of this, little baby one, that we use on Sunday mornings for our sermons. We digitally record every one of our sermons, so they can be uh, downloaded from our web page uh, as audio files for people to listen to during the week. Because a lot of times people will come up to you after a sermon and go, Pastor, do you have a copy of that sermon? No, I don't have a copy of that sermon. I'm old. I, I, you know, I, I do an outline and I memorize it. I don't have a seven page or four page or whatever manuscript to give you, but I can do this for you. Go on the website. There's the audio file. Simple. Simple. And it's a little recorder. And the one we use in the pulpit is like this. It's this big. And before I preach, I hit record. <laughs> when I am done, I hit stop. That's all that's involved. So could you do that? Sure you could. That's a, that's a preaching tool that you can use as well. All right, moving on. Uh, a USB card adapter. This little guy is like five bucks on Amazon. So the little card, uh, the uh, little card, that is in the recording device, goes in there, you plug it in your USB, and it pops up magically on your computer screen, and voila, there it is. I drag it over to my computer screen, and then I name it, uh, whatever the movie is we're doing. So this week, uh, tomorrow, 9 a.m. Eastern Time, uh, Hidden Figures is the movie we're doing. Uh, we're doing that in honor of Black History Month. I preached last Sunday at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Jacksonville, uh, which is our African-American congregation on the other side of town, Current, currently pastorly vacant. Uh, and I just had such a wonderful time with those folks. They're, they're a late pastor. He died of cancer. Um, he and I were very dear friends. And uh, James worked on the chapter in the book with me because... I'm a guy from New Jersey who did not have his experiences as a black pastor from Alabama. So it was fascinating to learn and grow, and that's culture. There's your cultural collision, right? And to take that to the next level and share it in writing in, in a podcast. So, USB card adapter. A place to upload your content for distribution. So how are you going to get this beyond your website and your people. So when I started down this road, that's the one question Tim Allman didn't really have for me an answer to, is how do I distribute this to like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all that. That little squiggly symbol is for Anchor. A-N-C-H-O-R. Anchor. Anchor is now owned by Spotify. Here's the best part. It's free. Who doesn't like free? Who likes free? All right, there you go. You get candy for free. So you raised your hand. You get a box of candy. That's how this works. Free. And it's totally free. It's an easy thing. It took me five minutes. I kid you not, five minutes to set up the account. And 
Now I have a place to upload these files. It allows me to title it, cover art, all this, which we're going to cover next, uh, set a date, time to push it out into the world, and it goes out to every podcasting platform you can imagine. So what do you think is the most popular podcasting platform for us? Apple Podcasts, it sure is, because the majority of the United States uses the Apple phone, the iPhone. So Apple Podcasts, it's over 55, I think it's 52 or 55% of our audience listens on Apple Podcasts. The next largest segment, Spotify. So we have some pretty long <clears throat> reach, and it doesn't cost me anything. Zero. So get home, Google Anchor, you'll see, look for that symbol. They changed it recently. I like their old one better. Uh, I'm old. I like what the old was always better, right? So look for that symbol and just go through. Just take a look at it. Before you ever set anything up, just take a look at it. And I'm telling you, it is so ridiculously easy. When I go to do our podcast, we're going to get to the intro and exit in a moment, but I just drag over. It's a drag box. I just click on it. It pops up my files. I go to my podcast file. I drop in the conclusion, I drop in the movie we're doing, I drop in the file for my introduction, and then I hit save, it takes me to another page, I title it, brief description, uh, what, uh, what is the series we're in, so we're se this is our third, year, our third uh, season of doing this, what episode number, and then when do I want to publish it, I tell it, this date, this time, hit save, and I'm done. So when we go to do a podcast, do you know how long that whole process takes us from recording to posted and ready to go? 45 minutes. That is not hard. And I'm not a tech genius. That I, I, can t I'm, I can't upload my files to the app. That's why I give me your emails and I'll send you the files, okay? Uh, so logo and cover art, this is the next thing that you do. You need to have an identifiable marker for your podcast. It's very nuts and bolts and practical. So this one here, the uh, Christ Culture Cinema white one, I did that through clip art. You know, I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I'm like, oh, shoot, I need cover art. Well, I'm not going to put a picture of me. That would be insulting. So we're going to do something that, and when I, was, right, when I started venturing on this, I've always had the vision. So this isn't a movie, but it's a, a show about movies. Who remembers Mystery Science Theater 3000 on Comedy Central? MST3K. Yeah. All right, Devo if you've never seen it, go YouTube it. So you had uh, a guy and two robots, and they would come down the aisle, and they were like the silhouettes. You would see the silhouette of a human being and two robots. And then they would show really awful movies like the, the 50 foot colossal woman. All right? And these guys would just talk during the movie. They would critique the movie. I used to love this show. So I've always had this vision of that. But now enter CPH and we're going to talk about publishing next. And <laughs> that wasn't going to work. <laughs> Yeah, this was my vision for the cover of the book, and you're like, yeah, and that's not going to work. So they took my vision, and if you look, and you can see on, we'll get something else out. Who drinks, like, beer and stuff? I drink beer sometimes. There you go. Here. You get a coaster. Oh, candy. It's a candy. Christ culture. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, man. Well, you know what? He's so disappointed. We'll give you candy, too. Here. Look at that. Two things. Ooh. Who else wants a coaster? It's a giveaway. Have a coaster. Look, we're giving away coasters. Look, you get two because of your energy for coasters. Who knew there was such energy for coasters? Oh, my word. Well, if you take a look at the cover art, this is what CPH came up with because they were going to put it on a book. But they said, hey, we love your podcast, which scared me that anything in our denomination likes what I do. That scared me for a moment, okay? I just want to share that. And they created that for me. So it's a specific piece. I did, once I dropped it into Anchor, I never have to touch it again. Now, my wife is a devoted listener to podcasts. She listens to things like Crime Junkie. She, yeah, let's see, Crime, she has a shirt, Crime Junkie. You know, it's, uh, she listens to another podcast. It's a, it's a woman who reads books. I'm like, that's called books on tape, honey. You know, that's uh, but it's a woman who reads old classic books and she listens to it and it's a chapter a day. 
She finds it very soothing. She has a British accent. It's very lovely. So, all right. She told me, though, if you're going to do this, you got to get serious. you got to have introduction and conclusion music because that's part of the consistency and the, right? You're all nodding your heads. I am not a musician, but what am I going to do? So introduce GarageBand on an Apple computer. So I, my, my Mac was a new Mac. My old one after 12 years died. Isn't that amazing? 12 years on a computer. We, we think of that as like a long time for something in technology. So I got this new computer and they gave me a free tutorial on anything I wanted to for an hour uh, with a technician. So I said, GarageBand, tell me all about GarageBand. I went through the tutorial. This is what I created with regards to, I'm just going to play you the introduction. So give me two minutes of your life and you'll see the difference. So this is GarageBand, Christ Culture and Cinema. Hold on. Hold on. We're going to do that again. Preston Buxton and Lee Michael Fox as they explore the intersection of faith, movies, and our contemporary context. Now, number one, it was my voice. That was my little script. That was my voice. Secondly, my wife's first reaction was, kind of sounds like a porno. <laughs> I'm like, we're going to go with it because I got nothing else, okay? But our, our exit music is identical, and it always ends with, until next time, we'll see you at the movies as we go through. Thank you for joining Christ Culture and Cinema with the Dr. Jeffrey Skopak and his assistant, Michael Pop. Until next time, we'll see you at the movies. Same music. Now, in my church, I have a guy, Jonathan McClellan. And Jonathan, great guy. He became a devoted listener to the podcast because once he heard we did Zombieland, he's like, I'm going to check this out. My pastor watches Zombieland. I'm all in. So he's listening to it. And one day he uh, comes to me after church and he goes, you know, pastor, uh, you want to up the game a little bit on the podcast? And I said, well, what, what do you have in mind, Jonathan? He goes, well, you know, I work in radio. Well, okay, this is cool. This, I'm all in. He said, so what is your vision, really, of what the music is supposed to be? And I said, you, you remember the 1940s and 50s music with the big band and the, like, hooray for Hollywood? But you can't use hooray for Hollywood because then they'll want royalties. But that kind of sound. So Jonathan goes, I've got it. Let me take care of it. And this is what Jonathan came up with. The doctor, Jeffrey Skopak, and his trusted assistant, Michael Pop, as they explore the intersection of faith, movies, and our contemporary context. So when Michael and I played this for the first time, we sat in my office laughing hysterically because we're like, that is way too good for us two schmoes. We've got to up our game. All right, that was, the, that was our immediate, oh my word, reaction to it. And, and that just entered. We just started using this in season three. And the conclusion is identical, but it's great. The DJ at the end of it, he goes, until next time, we'll see you at the movies. And he's laughing as he says it. And it's just great. It's like it reflects kind of the fun nature of what we're doing. All right? You need an outline that you will follow for your content on that back table. Like I said, I had some outlines for you. Our podcast is the same every single week. So we start with the intro music. Then this is what you get. What is the movie? Then... We start with a little banter. I'll always go is, welcome back to Christ Culture and Cinema. How are you doing today, Michael? And then Michael will throw in something like, hey, we're getting ready for the boys' basketball tournament. Or when he had COVID and he came back, I said, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And Michael goes, hallelujah. And I said, you're back from COVID. Oh, well, you only reserve that for Jesus. Well, and you too now. And we kind of have a little fun banter. Then we introduce the movie. This is the title. The next thing we say, when did it release? When did this movie come out? We then say, how much did it cost? 
How much did it make at the box? And we banter about that. Because sometimes movies make way more internationally. Some make very little money in this world by the box, but you know it's making Ganga money somewhere. That's why they're raising my Netflix price, right? So we know they're making money. We then talk about the director, and if the director is a significant director, we may mention some other things he did. We then go through the cast. Who is the actors or actresses? What were the parts they played? And we talk about what other things they were in to see intersections. And we'll go, we'll take a look. They were both in this movie, but they happen to be in this movie as well together. Maybe they're friends, and we'll banter about it. Then we talk about the plot of the movie. We talk about what was the movie really about. So most recently we did Encanto. Great movie. All right, and we talk about the plot line of Encanto. Now we're going to talk about the cultural hook in the movie. And for us in Encanto, we go down a rabbit hole of transgenerational uh, pain and anguish. Because that's really the story of Encanto. The grandmother, it's a, when you think about it, the husband is killed by people chasing them. The magic candle creates the casita and the Encanto that they live in. They all have these gifts, but Grandma's a hard woman. And depending on where you sit when watching that movie, that determines how you view it. So I go to this place, Stretch Lab, because I am old and inflexible, so it's assisted stretching. And the gal who helps me, her name is Crystal. Crystal is from Puerto Rico. Crystal is built. I mean, she could take me out. She is strong. And she identified with the character Luisa. But I talked to someone else who identified with Mirabelle because her mother was awful to her growing up because of pain and suffering in the past. And we talk about this. Now all of a sudden, where's the, cr where's the crossover to faith? Now we're going to bring in faith. And my, my associate this time goes, you know, have you ever really stopped to take a look at the arc of Jacob and Esau to Joseph? And look at the transgenerational trauma in that family. They're a mess. They are absolutely a parallel to this Encanto. As you look at this, and we, we talk about this, and then we have a question of the day. We always give you something to ponder and think about, and then we'll end with, and next time, we'll tell you what movie we're going to do. And then we always end with the words, until next time, we'll see you at the movies, cue the music. That's our outline. We are rigid and slavish to it. Because we want predictability. We want people to know when they tune us in, that's what they're going to get. Okay? Long-range schedule. So Michael and I, we, if you try to do this one a week kind of thing, so we do weekly. Some, some podcasts are monthly, some are bi-weekly. We're weekly. Does ministry get messy sometimes? Yeah, so there are times where it's like, uh-oh, we haven't recorded the podcast yet. So we work ahead, and we try to get three to four weeks out uh, ahead of this. So we'll take like two days and just power through, and then it's done, and we upload it, and we forget about it. Uh, this will give you an idea. This, we took an old office in our church, turned it into a recording studio. That's our setup. That entire setup costs less than $300. And that, uh, the sound tiles we put on the room to kill the echo, Amazon, 98 bucks. So, and then in this scene over here, this is Michael again. Michael's to my left. Uh, it was my old principal to the right. We do a lot of video casting stuff. So we bought the banner. The banner is the most expensive thing in the room. The dumb banner costs like $450. And I'm like, I got all this really good digital recording stuff, and we do, it's, our quality is outstanding. So, all right. Things that are nice to have but are not necessary to do this, better quality microphones. The better the microphone, the better the sound quality. It's just, that's what it is. So just know what your budget is. We helped uh, Mission Nation Publishing. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. They work with modern-day missionaries to the United States, and they write biographies and stories about them. So they've started a podcast where they interview modern-day missionaries in the United States. They had no idea what to do. We helped them get started, and I bought them a microphone and a digital recorder, and it was $125 for the whole rig for them to get going. 
So we're not talking major money. And then of course, if you have a, a building where you have a room, this is a great way to get rid of junk in your church and turning it into something purposeful. So this was a catch-all room in our church. It was an office nobody was using that everybody left stuff there. So I went in there one day and threw everything out and said, this is now the recording studio. And huh, who knew COVID was coming? But we've used that room more than any other room in our office suite. Very, very simple to do. It doesn't need to be super high end. I would tell you, if you go to our podcast and listen to it, uh, except for Toy Story, where Michael was home with COVID and we did it by Zoom and he didn't have a good internet connection. It's a shame because it would have been a good podcast, but it just is not our best. Uh, listen to the others. Our, our quality, our sound quality is better than some of the higher end ones. And it's just being purposeful about it. That's all it is. Okay, uh, we get to the last P. I think I'm right on track. So let's stop with podcasting for a second. I'm sure you may have some questions. I, I do, and it's not, it's more of a, an overarching question. So let's say that someone is passionate about hunting. Mm-hmm. How do you evaluate whether or not that would be a good topic to choose for doing a podcast. How do you evaluate topic and connection? Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate your audience? Is this going to be applicable to the people in our area? Are we trying to bring people to the church? Are we trying to reach people out in the ether? How do you go through that? That's a really good question. When we started this, we did not have a vision of where this was going to go. We have learned from experience that this has gone everywhere. So in the back, though, another article I had there, um, for those of you who are able to pick it up, again, I apologize. I'm not going to blame Jeff Schrank because he'll hurt me. Uh, Love Jeff. I have uh, have copyright on the expression shrankified and shrankification. This is a shrankified event. Jeff does everything big, right? Um, But I have an article in there for you, and it is called The Best 35 Christian Movie Podcasts. Um, And I I stumbled across this when I was Googling our own podcast to prepare for this. And this particular agency, um, they have evaluated over 250,000 podcasts and blogs. So I'm like, huh, why am I popping up in here? So they, they have a, a, a category called Christianity and Cinema. We're number 16. And I'm going, how, how is that even possible? You know, because we've never thought extended audience. So for the first time, we really started thinking extended audience. So realize whatever your idea is, there is somebody out there who also has an interest in it. That's culture again. That's number one. Number two, how does your faith intersect with that idea? So I would probably be really challenged in hunting as your example only because I'm not a hunter. But if you are a hunter and you know lots of other hunters and you could have faith conversation in the midst of hunting and can probe scripture to find scriptural hooks in hunting, you got something there. You really do. Now, I could never create that podcast because it's just not my thing. But just like other people couldn't create Christ culture and cinema because they just don't have the memory. I, I have a weird memory, which drives my wife crazy. Because I'll just occasionally just drop lines for movies on her, and she'll just go, stop it, stop it, stop it. Uh, you know, it's really, it's fun. It's a lot of fun to do that to her. So our favorite is, you know, when, he, when she says, oh, watch out, there's danger ahead. Is there, uh, go, grave danger? And she'll go, is there any other kind? What movie? A Few Good Men. There it is. It's A Few Good Men. So we, we can, so I can sustain that idea. And I know there are other people who like it. it. Whatever it is, you can actually go, and if you look at the article, it'll tell you the name of the agency there. And uh, take a look and see what's out there. Type in your idea. I bet you you find a podcast on whatever your idea is. doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, 
but go listen to theirs. So when I came up with this idea, and we're going to get to the publishing last with CPH on this thing, uh, actually issues, etc., you know, issues, etc., they contacted CPH and asked, well, why was I writing that book, me, meaning me? And CPH's answer was, well, because he had the idea and submitted a proposal. <laughs> because there's another two, two LCMS pastors out, on the West Co out here on the West Coast that were doing something. Theirs is very different than ours. Ours is much more down-to-earth, folksy, not high-flying theology, but more practical intersection with Scripture, which lends itself to a much broader audience. So, for us, it was a surprise to get beyond the church. We really didn't think beyond our church and a handful of other people who would tune in. And then when all of a sudden we have this kind of global audience, which was crazy to us because we get reports on where it goes and we have people listening to our podcast in England, Germany, Singapore. Uh, it's about 30 countries now. And we're going, how in, Michael and I, you know, Michael and I, we, we're not the brightest bulbs. We're going, we're not that smart. How did this happen? And, and that's where you go, well, the spirit is working in this. The spirit can work in this, in this genre. We're sharing faith in a very different way using a vehicle that is just culturally relevant. So. It's a great question. I have no idea um, because I only get reports on what those who listen to it directly on Anchor. And we have about 2,000 on Anchor. But our biggest podcasting platform is Apple. I mean, Anchor is only about 15% of our listenership. So if you do the math, it's kind of crazy. Can yeah. I just drop something in there? I, I, I think the, at, like the top 10% of podcasts get listened to 300 times over the first week. So it's not like... Right. Crazy huge numbers. So the vast majority of podcasts will get listened to 40, 50 times, maybe. So yeah. if you're worried about, like, oh, we're only going to hit 20 people, most podcasts yeah. do hit 20 people. I mean, our first podcast we ever did was The Blues Brothers. We decided that would be a great movie to do because we were on a mission from God. I mean, come on. And my associates from Chicago. So it just made sense to do that. And that one in the first week was listened to 75 times. And it's just been... Uphill, and we can see when we pick certain movies, we see the dips, but we some we choose movies sometimes because we believe they're important regardless. So we recently did a movie that was just released on Netflix. Don't look up. Have any of you seen Don't Look Up? My wife, she got irritated at the movie and walked out. Uh, it's my wife, you know. I'm the real, you know. It just wasn't for her because she wasn't getting the satir the satirical nature of the movie, where it just obliterates everybody. It really does. And, and looking at society, and we started talking about Christian. The beautiful moment in that movie is at the end when they know the world is going to be destroyed, and they're sitting around the table, and the skateboard kid that they, you know, pick up along the way. Uh, and they're going to pray at the table, and none of them know how to pray. Because these are all astronomers and his family, and they don't know how to pray. So he, uh, Leo, Leo DiCaprio says, okay, let's pray. Um, amen. And they're going, well, that's not a prayer. And it's the kid who is the least character in the movie, says, I've got this. And he rattles off this prayer where you're going, that's spot on. And all of a sudden, faith comes in the moment of mortality. So we felt it was important to do the movie. Every so often, I'll throw a movie out there. My associate hasn't seen it. He goes to watch it, and he goes, I can't believe you made me watch this. We watched Uncut Gems. We did Uncut Gems with Adam Sandler. That is a hard movie to watch. You hate that guy. At the end of the movie, when he does get shot in the head, it isn't a spoiler alert. You want him to get shot in the head, I promise you. It's awful. He's such a terrible human being. And it, and it really is about the consequence of sin that is just running out of control and you can't stop it. And think about people in your life who have this kind of repeti repetition of sin and you're going, stop, and they can't. And, and he goes, yeah, we needed to watch that movie. You know, we needed, the, we needed to address that one. 
you know, and then we'll turn around and do dodgeball, you know, the story of an American underdog. Uh, it's, it's where we're at. So uh, let's move on to publishing just so I can get through the rest of this. And there isn't really much more. So the written word has power. Writing codifies speaking, thus turning words into objects of conscious reflection. In other words, writing ideas makes them more concrete to us. By mulling over written words, we are better able to internalize and understand them and to allow them to affect our behavior. And with that being said, imagine if you handed your sermon out to your congregation to read it a week before you delivered it. To chew on the word. I've often thought about that. I work about four to six weeks out. I know I'm a weird duck. Uh, drives my associate crazy, you know. But imagine if you did that. The written word really does have power. So, how many of you have a favorite book? Yeah. And think about the power that word has for you. So where can I share my written words? And this is really, I'm working backwards, because if you want to know where this whole idea started, it started here. Uh, Facebook public page. Years ago, I started a public page to keep crazy people out of my yard. I, it's the only way I can put it. Our church body has some crazy folks, and this was a way to keep them out of my yard. Because I'm somewhat known in some sections of the world, and... This was just a way to deflect because people will friend you. It's another topic for another day, but are they really your friends? You know, they're, they're just somebody who's attached to an electronic footprint that you're leaving. Uh, so I established a public Facebook page and invite people to like and follow the page. I push people to this page is what I do. Uh, that's my family, by the way. This is my dear wife. She puts up with a lot. Uh, so having said that, you can publish regularly using this tool. This is an easy tool, and guess what it costs again? Nothing. nothing. It costs nothing. So that my public page has 1,303 followers, and it's global. That's the crazy thing, and we'll get to why that's global. Uh, I have 1,268 people who like it, which means when I post something on here, it shows up in their feed. So the impact. One article that I wrote was seen by 850,000 plus people today. It's been shared 3,601 times. And it has circulated the globe and has led to 224 other clicks from it. What was the article? So in October of 2019, there was a little movie that came out starring Joaquin Phoenix called The Joker. And my son, who at the time was in the Coast Guard out in California, said, Dad, you got to go see this movie. I said, I don't want to see this movie. It just wasn't on my radar screen. There was too much crazy going on around it. My daughter happened to be home. It's my son on the right, daughter there next to my wife. Uh, she said, Dad, let's go. Now, my wife was not going to the Joker. Fine. So off to the movies we go. And we sit down. And this movie unfolds before my eyes. And I realize I watch movies differently. And I was absolutely riveted to the screen. It is a powerful story of emotional, physical, mental abuse. As his character spirals downward, there is violence, yes. There's a breaking point, yes. There is a comic book character about it, for sure. But this is an indictment to everybody sitting there watching this movie that we're not doing enough in the world of mental health and care. A, a, a spot, as I'm watching this, where the church used to be. And we've been pushed and prodded out of it. And as, a, as we're driving home from the theater, I'm like, my brain is exploding. It's on overload at this point. And I'm just, blah, 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 it's just coming out of my mouth. And my, I knew my daughter had t totally tuned me out because she didn't see what I was seeing. I got home, I couldn't sleep. Next morning I wake up, I get to the office, I opened up my computer and I typed the blog post. I have it pinned to the top of the public page so you can go there and see the actual article. I get the numbers. And within two weeks, it had circled the globe. And I'm going, what just happened? That was a powerful moment. The next night, we went to see the movie Judy. Did you ever see the movie Judy? Judy turns up in the book. 
Judy is the Judy Garland story. My wife wanted to see it. It's a beautiful movie. Starts with the beginning of her career. Wizard of, when she is being uh, cast for Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, and the bulk of the movie is at the end. Her last performance is in England before she dies. And you've got to fill in the arc of her life between A and B. That's, that's what you have to do in the movie. You, you have to work. And this movie moved me. And, and mind you, we saw it the night it was released, and I saw it on a screen like this big, because it was not big. It was not a big promotion movie. Br uh, BBC did it. And I was in tears at the end of the movie. It takes a lot to get me there, but I was there. Because when they said Judy Garland died at the age of 47. Whoa. Powerful. And all this woman wanted was to be ordinary. She had this extraordinary voice. Maybe one of the greatest voices ever in Hollywood. But all she wanted to do was be a mom to her kids. And her, her voice, her fame, her fortune, the people around her wouldn't let that happen. And have we ever honored the ordinary? Have we ever gone, life is good right where I am. And think about ministry. It's good right where you are. So I wrote another article. That didn't get quite the response because no, nobody had seen the movie. But all of a sudden, I had a platform where I could write. So the public Facebook page, great place to go. Uh, the blog, I have never blogged. I don't know why, maybe it's an aversion to the word, but a blog is an online journal where an individual or a group presents a record of activities, thoughts, or beliefs. It's a place to share opinions, knowledge with the world, wide web community. So think of the blog. I started one. You know how long it took me to set that up? I did it three days ago or a week ago, something like that. It took me 10 minutes, and it's totally free on Bloggerspot. Anybody can blog. You can write, share your thoughts, blog away. Uh, so to get it started, I just uh, took two excerpts from the book and put them up there, and now I'm committed, and I know me, I'm going to be crazy about, oh gosh, i got to write something every single week. But that's another very easy resource. Uh, it's a venue to write and share. It's easy to create. It's free. It re this requires the discipline of regular writing. So for some of you, that's hard. Now, I want to share with you, though, this. How far can a blog go? So Dr. Bernard Bull, he's here from uh, Concordia Seward. Uh, he started a blog, etal.org. While posting once every week or two within a year, he had almost 100,000 unique visitors attending his blog and reading his articles. Uh, he's written a wonderful book, I asked CPH to borrow this, uh, digitized. If you haven't seen this at the CPH table, go pick up, buy a copy of this book. It's a rare moment I'll tell you to buy something, buy this book. Uh, he really talks about the influence of technology, the digital world on ministry. That, that's, his, that's his ballywick of education. Uh, finally, books. And that's right, books. Uh, the most difficult mountain to climb in connecting people to the intersection of your passion and faith is publishing. Why is this? CPH is not here. They left. Good. All right. Do you have enough material for a book? So it's just like the podcast. Do you have enough to actually write something? Uh, secondly, do you have the capacity to write a book? This is not an insult. Not everybody was meant to write a book. I found it easy because I'm a writer. I love to write. I don't like blogging, but I like writing. When it's something I'm passionate about, I will write. And do you have the capacity to do that? So do some sample runs at this. When I gave my manuscript in the CPH for editing, there was, it went, by the way, it went through doctrinal review with nothing. Uh, yeah, it was a Jesus moment. Yeah, it really was. That was the Holy Spirit was in the room. I don't know what was going on there. It was, in the words of a late professor of mine, it was a Shekinah experience is what it was. I'm like, really, nothing? And they said, no, in fact, the uh, doctrinal reviewer said, this is a good book. I think you're going to sell a lot of these. Wow, so that's good. Uh, but with the editing portion, there really wasn't much substantive editing that went on. But I'm a very particular, specific writer. I'm not going to turn in things with lots of mistakes. So do you have the capacity? Third, do you have a publisher who thinks your idea has merit? That's the biggest one. Self-publishing is the hardest hill to climb. 
because you, you fall in love with yourself. You need, you need critics over your shoulder. I had critics at CPH. They, they, were, they were critical on some things, and I had to push back on some things, and it was okay. Uh, when you're self-publishing, you're in an echo chamber by yourself. I have a friend who's a, he's a writer. He writes um, apocalyptic fiction, and he employs an editor. Uh, so he self-publishes. He's on Amazon. His name's Michael Banner. It's all about like solar flares, knocks out the global grid, this kind of stuff. But he, he pays a, uh, an editor to edit his material because otherwise you're in an echo chamber and you think you're the most brilliant person and you're not. Uh, finally, will the book sell? See above uh, the publisher because <laughs> they're not going to publish it if they don't think they're going to sell it. So keep that in mind. All right. Um, so, the book conundrum. Publishing does not move quickly. I signed the contract to write Christ Culture and Cinema November of 2019. It was, I turned in the manuscript that they, by a month before the deadline, March of 2021. They released it January 18, 22. Do not think they move nimbly and fast. It is the opposite of your blog, your public Facebook page, your podcast. Secondly, what can you do, or what you can do on a podcast and blog, you may not be able to do in a published book. There are many movies that CPH went, <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, but think about that. Uh, you can be more free in these other platforms. This is more restrictive. Uh, your audience dramatically changes. It ages quickly is what happens. It really does. Uh, and then finally, the published work provides legitimacy to your passion and offers a permanent footprint in the public arena. So think about that. There's, there's something very definitive about a book as opposed to a, a digital file a post on a Facebook page. People resonate to the written word. Okay? With that all being said, where do you go from here? What you do with all of this is entirely up to you. Uh, it's going to require work. Whichever niche of the marketplace you choose, it requires dedication of time. So I am a very disciplined time manager. Podcast, we know when we're doing it, how long it's going to take. If it takes longer than that, I lose my mind. My associate knows that. When I write, even writing the book, I had a very disciplined pattern of writing when I wrote. So you have to be disciplined. Uh, it requires a fair measure of faith because you have no idea who's going to read it, listen to it, interact with it, and the like. But these vehicles expand the spiritual conversation in places it would otherwise not go. And that, to me, is the most critical thing. You're speaking into a much broader platform than you ever had. I have no idea who's listening or reading a lot of this stuff. But it's kind of neat knowing that because you're out there. You're, you're part of the, the digitized world. So questions, comments, thoughts. We're at the, I got a couple of minutes, I think. Who else, who, who wants something? Anybody want candy? Oh, come on, everybody wants candy. I got to get rid of the candy. It's like, good heavens, CPH gave me so much. So I'm giving out candy. Questions, comments, thoughts? Here, I gave you, you got yours. Yes? What mistakes did you make in the beginning that you wish you could have known or would avoid or advise? So one of the mistakes I made early on in this thing was not really talking uh, with my board of elders about the type of movies we were going to be doing. And the one movie we did was Gran Torino. Now remember, I'm in a southern culture. And one of my elders, a very gentlemanly guy, goes, Well, Pastor, you did that Gran Torino movie. That's a foul-mouthed, cross-laced movie. He's a bad guy, blah, 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 blah. And he just ripped me up one side and down the other. And by the grace of God, my head elder, who's an old army guy, goes, a guy was my father. And you could hear a pin drop. He goes, I grew up with that man. I know what that man was all about. And... It became a real tense elders meeting. That gentleman's no longer on our board of elders, but it's okay because guess who's reading the book and texted me last night about it? That guy. He's, he's all in now because he's understanding that we're trying to have this conversation. But if you're going to do it from your church and you have some things that might be edgy, 
it's good to talk to them about it. Who else wants candy? Another question. When you, um, do you write articles directly on Facebook? Yeah, I just go right to my public page. It says publish. And what I usually do is I'll write it out on, I, since I have a Mac, I use, uh, Apple, I use uh, the Apple program. And then I just copy it and paste it in. Uh, and I'll usually find a picture. I'm a very visual person. That's why movies also resonate with me. And I'll post it. So like when you get to the Joker one, I found this amazing picture of Joaquin Phoenix when he's sitting at the mirror and he does this. He's forcing the smile. And here's this article about mental health. And it's really, it was like the perfect, and I just hit publish, poof, and off it goes. So it's very easy, and I, I do recommend the public page only because people are going to put stuff on there that may not be so kind. Now, the amazing thing is with 850,000 uh, views and all these comments, I didn't have a single negative one. There were one or two that said, this is a great article. Well, then they had to bring that Jesus stuff into it. But I can live with that because guess what? They read it. <laughs> More candy. Another question. I'm coming back this way with candy. And who has a question? John wants candy. Yes, question. Do you monetize the podcast? Monetize how? Oh, yeah. Uh, podcasts make money if you want. Um, I have two, two people who contribute regularly to the podcast. I'm not sure why they do. Um, and when you hit certain benchmarks, it's like these other digital things. If you hit really extreme numbers, they want to pay you because they want to advertise on yours. But we've intentionally not had any advertisement on ours whatsoever because we want it to be kind of clean. We just want it to be a church vehicle. But you can make money with it. Sure. Other questions? Yes, you get candy too. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Speaking of actors and actresses, do you look to see how their personal lives intersect with faith and work that into Sometimes. That's a good question. So it all depends on the movie and if the actor or actress has some hook that fits in. So we did, so one of the chapters in the book is um, a, a Princess Bride. So the way we arrived at the movies, just so you know, first movie is Gladiator. Everybody has seen it because it is on television every single day. All right. At Toy Story is the second. Third is Hidden Figures. Fourth is Captain America, the first Avenger. Fifth is Judy. What is six? My brain is frying. Seven is The Princess Bride. And when we did Princess Bride, it had way more to do about Andre the Giant Thank you. I knew I was missing one. That's it. Stars born. So seven, Andre the Giant, who is a professional wrestler. I'll admit it. I grew up. I love professional wrestling. My son and I bonded over it. Klein loves it too. It's all great. But Andre the Giant was a giant. The man was seven foot four. I met him in high school. He wrestled in my high school gym. He put his hand and he could cover your whole head with his fingers. It was crazy. But everybody knew him as the giant. When he got to act in the movie, he loved it. Because you know what they treated him as? Andre. And they loved him. And there's a wonderful YouTube video about the love of the cast for Andre. So the real love story in The Princess Bride, what makes that movie work, is not the script. It's Andre the Giant. They loved him. These people were weeping about his death. You know, Princess Buttercup, who's in that movie, also happens to show up in a little movie called Forrest Gump. She's Jenny. Okay? And you should hear her weep over Andre the Giant. Mandy Patinkin weeps over this. That's love. That's, that's exactly what I was talking about in this movie. So, yeah. So, that happens. Good question. Other. Yeah. Uh, what about the format of having two people talking? Uh, is What's, what are those options as far as bringing in interview people? Yeah. Uh, can one person just hold down a podcast and do it with interviewing? You can do this. I was on the um, uh, Mission Nation Publishing podcast, and they interviewed me. I'm not a modern. I'm a modern day missionary to a sort. On one, or did they have two no, it was just one on one. It was her and me. Okay. 
And uh, Sarah Saying, who works at the uh, Concordia Seminary St. Louis, does the podcast. Uh, there, there are programs to do remote ones, by the way. We haven't done a remote one because it's a little more tricky uh, to do that to keep the quality. But I did one with Sarah. She asked questions. I did the bulk of the talking because we were talking about my ministry, particularly when I was in Tucson down the road here working with refugees and the Mexican population that surrounded my church. Um, so yeah, you can do that for sure. Uh, trying to do it alone is hard. Um, if you ever notice, there's usually at least two people. I have four microphone jacks. Uh, and occasionally, now my son sat in on one. He lives in Orlando, Florida now. And uh, we did the movie The Florida Project. If you haven't seen it, oh my word, it is. You think you're watching a documentary, but it's about the poverty right outside the Magic Kingdom on Route 192. Brilliant movie. Oh my gosh, and the only person in it that of any nature uh, of no, uh, that you would know uh, by uh, Hollywood standards is Willem Dafoe. Other than that, there's nobody in it. The, the girl, the key girl in the movie, it's the first movie she's ever done. And my son's like, we've got to do this movie. I'll come up and guest. And he's going to come back. We're going to do uh, The House of Gucci. Uh, he has style. My son likes, he likes to dress nicely. So we're doing The House of Gucci with him. And he'll come up to our, to our office to do it. Yes? So you have wonderful vehicles like uh, Facebook where you can just say, hey, check out my blog. Uh, you can get friends to check out your blog. Um, just share it that way and, and it'll multiply itself over time. People will continue to, to find it. And it usually just takes one good thing and all of a sudden everybody is checking you out. I am at the hour. Are there any other questions? This, this, by the way, is my contact information. Please avail yourself to it. Um, I'd say come and visit. We live about a half mile off the beach. It's a great place to live. How 